Chapter 35 of Sky Song by Abby Elphinstone. Esker. The Ice Queen stood up from the organ. Not possible, she murmured. Balapan dived low and landed on Esker's shoulder, and with the strength of the eagle willing her on, Esker advanced through the hall. The Ice Queen turned to Slither. Find the boy, just in case he's lurking, and kill him while I destroy the eagle. The fur and feather battle cries clamoured again, and Esker holding the frost horn in front of her like a shield strode on towards the ice cream. She had no voice but she had an eagle on her shoulder and a heart full of courage so she kept walking, veering round the organ to the heap of shattered ice where Blue and Pebble had once been. Soon the ice will melt, the Queen cried, you've lost your friends forever. But Esker wasn't listening. She raised the frost horn to her lips and thought of Blue and Pebble, of the little girl who had left her home to follow her brother through every danger possible and the fox pup who had tried his hardest to protect her in the bay. She blew gently this time, and the horn sung a different note again. Not the sky song, or the battle summoning, instead the sound was like the clouds rippling, and it stirred the crystals on the floor, whisking them up into the air until they swirled and glimmered. The ice queen rushed forward, but a shape was already emerging within the crystals, only it wasn't a statue any more. In its place stood a girl with ruddy cheeks and a bundle of fur wriggling in her arms. The Ice Queen raised her staff and shrieked, You will not undo my power, Esker! Black sparks shot out from her staff, but Esker stood in front of Blue, and as she held the frost horn in front of her, the sparks bounced off and fizzled out onto the floor. We Eskers tried, Blue shouted, and no longer scared that Esker was there to guard her, she stroked Pebble's head. We, her friends, and we never give up. Balapan cried out from Esker's shoulder and the Ice Queen stalked closer. Except Flint, she said quietly. He seemed very happy to run away earlier. Blue shook her head. Flint fight for Esker, always looking for her, always fighting for her, never leave. The Ice Queen sighed, blind as well as stupid. There was a scuffle of footsteps on the door. Come, Slither, the Ice Queen called. But it was not the shaman who emerged from the passageway. It was Flint. The Ice Queen snorted. If you tied Slither up with Willow Snatch, he'll break its curse in an instant. Flint raised an eyebrow. Not if the Willow Snatch is drenched in water gathered from a whirlpool. That'll bind him for months on end. He paused. You didn't think I'd enter your palace without a few inventions up my sleeve, did you? Eyes wild, the Ice Queen raised her staff towards Flint, but at that moment Blue rushed forward and kicked the Queen in the back of the leg. Flint's draw dropped. His sister, alive and full of fight. Black sparks ricocheted off the walls as the Ice Queen stumbled to her knees, but it gave Flint the chance he needed and he darted towards the trees, grabbing Blue by the hand as he raced. He thrust a small wooden box at Esker and from her shoulder Balapan croaked. Your memories. Flint panted as Pebble nuzzled round his legs. I searched the whole palace until I found this in the throne turret. Esker could scarcely believe what she was hearing. Flint hadn't abandoned her. He'd gone to find her past. When I saw the Ice Queen's power over Blue, Flint cried, I realised that we needed all the help we could get to beat her. You need to remember who you are, Esker, if you're going to take back your voice. The Ice Queen was on her feet again, her staff aimed at Esker. You won't be able to open it, she shrieked. There is no key. I held it to the bottom of the ocean the day I captured you. Esker's skin trembled, but Flint held up his anything knife to the keyhole and twisted it this way and that. The Ice Queen strode forward, and though the power of the frost horn was enough to keep the black sparks of her magic away from the group, a trail of sweat inched down Esker's back as Flint worked his knife in the lock. Come on, brother, Blue urged. Quick! Flint fumbled with the knife, but the Ice Queen was upon them now, brandishing her staff, and then, just as she brought it down, a shadow fell across her. Esker glanced up to see a large shape had filled one of the palace arches, and she realised she recognised those broad shoulders and white set legs, wide set legs, white fur. The Urken bear leapt into the room and bounded across the floor towards the Ice Queen. She took a few steps backwards and then remembered herself and aimed her staff at the raging bear. A burst of sparks shot out and Urken bear tumbled backwards, but it was up again in seconds. Flint worked harder with his knife until there was a click, and as White Fur launched himself at the Ice Queen, Esker pushed the wooden lid open. A swirl of colours twisted towards her, and as they fell about her face, it felt to Esker as if she was looking at a rainbow through the mist. But then the mist seemed to fade and the colours became stronger, and finally Esker saw her pass clearly. 
She was sledging in the never cliffs with her ma. Then she was hunting caribou on the driftlands with her pa. Next she was making necklaces from river courts with her parents. Then she was running hand in hand with them across the foothills to catch a glimpse of a golden eagle. This was her past. A lifetime out in the wild with two people who loved her more than she could have hoped for. And suddenly knowing her place, knowing her beginnings and all that had come after that made her grip the frost horn harder. White fur wrestled with the Ice Queen, a whirl of claws and nails and fizzing black sparks, and as Eska saw them, like that a more painful memory surfaced. The last moments with her parents on the Driftlands, her ma crying out for her as the wolverines closed in, the Urken bear trying to set things right, and then a tusk warrior dragging her and her pa to Winterfang. White fur hadn't managed to hold the Ice Queen back then, but now he fought with a vengeance and as he thumped an enormous paw across the Queen's chest, pinning her to the ground, he growled at Eska. And Eska could hear the words in the growl because it was the language of those who wandered the wild. Take what is rightfully yours, it said. Take back your voice. Eska stormed towards the Ice Queen while Flint shoved blue behind him and took on the stream of tusk guards pouring through the arches. White fur winced at the Ice Queen, struggled beneath him, and sent a fresh flurry of sparks into his side. But Eska was running now, and she swung the frost horn at the Ice Queen's staff. The scepter broke apart upon impact, shattering into fragments of black ice. The Queen gasped as the ice melted before her eyes, and a gold mist seeped from her lips. It drifted into the hall and settled inside the baubles on the trees, until all of them shone gold once again. The Ice Queen raised her hand to her mouth, but an even brighter mist was slipping through her fingers now, a mist that burned as gold as Balapan's eyes. It swelled into the hall and Eska stood completely still as she breathed her voice back inside her. Leaving Flint to fight the last of the tusk guards, Eska sped across the room and leapt up into an ar open arch. Balapan glided to her shoulder and they looked at the fight below, a frenzy of blizzard balls, ice spears and willow-snatching javelins. Then Eska held the frost horn high, and desperately hoping she could remember its song, she threw her newfound voice out into the night. At first she sang the low, clear note, the one that sounded like an owl's hoot. Then she launched into the rippling melody, and her song rose like bubbles from the depth of the sea. A few of the tusk guards looked at her, their weapons suddenly limp in their hands, and Eska noticed then that their expressions had changed. They were no longer blank and ice-filled, their faces were filled with shock and shame, and something like hope. And though Eska didn't dare stop singing, she wondered whether the Ice Queen's hold over the Tusk army was gradually weakening. Eska let the melody grow louder, stronger, and as the sky song burst out, she could feel the power of the mountains and the forests and the glaciers stirring inside her. More Tusk guards stopped fighting, the wolverines and the Urken bears broke apart, and Eska saw Rook her face brighter and kinder than it had been in the lost chambers, pushed her way through the crowds towards the palace until she was standing alongside Jay and Tomkin. Eska blinked. Even the tusk guards, frozen by blizzard balls and imprisoned by willow snatch, were breaking free from the magic that had bound them and looking up to her with eager faces. All the tribes were listening now, because the Ice Queen's curses had worn off. Eska raised her eyes to the stars, to the mighty sky gods glistening from above, and as she sang the last part of the sky song, the melody filled with longing and heart and infinite wonder, the sound of her voice swelled up into the night and the northern lights began to dance. Balapan leapt from her shoulder, wheeling into the colours that spilled into rings and halos across the dark, and Eska knew then that no one in Erkenfald could doubt the presence of magic. The sky gods were up there and they were dancing for every tribe to see. Eska cleared her throat. A few weeks ago I was nothing more than a prisoner here at Winterfang, she cried. The Ice Queen locked me in a music box and told me I was cursed. She stole my parents, she stole my memories and she stole my voice. Eska took a deep breath. But together with the bravest inventor I know, I escaped and formed a tribe. And though it wasn't made up of warriors or people who dressed as and thought the same way, it was enough. Because we were brave and we kept hoping... And though the Ice Queen threw everything she had at us, tusk guards, curse walls, mountain ghouls and thunder ghosts, we threw more back. Balapan settled on her shoulder and ruffled her feathers. We kept going when everything fell apart. We trusted strangers, even when we didn't have a plan. She paused. And when the Ice Queen tried to silence us, we shouted louder. She raised the frost horn high, 
For almost a year we've lived in a kingdom, shrunk to whispers, in a place where tribes hide from one another in fear, but that is not our Erkenwald. It's time to reclaim our kingdom. There was a deafening roar from below as all three tribes cheered Eska on. She spun round to see the last of the tusk guards sitting on the floor, shaking his head as if waking from a terrible dream, as she knew that the Ice Queen's curse had been broken once and for all. She watched as Flint raked his anything knife through the baubles that hung through the trees. They crashed to the ground, finally free from the Ice Queen's enchantment, and as Blue stamped them into tiny pieces, the golden glow of the imprisoned voices drifted through the palace towards the ice towers. White fur was slumped over the Ice Queen and his weight held her still, but as Eska approached, clasping the frost horn tight, the Ice Queen's voice trickled out. You and I could work together, Eska. Two great voices with the power to... Eska didn't wait for any more. The Ice Queen was as weak as a rag doll now. Her power had been drained and Eska dragged her to her feet before shoving her towards the music box. She forced the Ice Queen onto the pedestal, then with Flint's help, she hauled the glass dome over the top and turned the small black key again and again, faster and faster until her whole arm ached. Music began, a clash of discordant notes this time, and very slowly the Ice Queen's body began to break apart into tiny shards of ice. Moments later, all that was left of her was a gown of frozen tears. Eska rushed back to White Fur and bent down beside him. Thank you, she whispered. You held the Ice Queen back so that I could call the tribes together. The Urken Bear didn't reply and Eska's hand stilled over his fur. White fur? She leaned over so that she could see his other side. It was red beyond repair and only then did Eska realise what had happened. While she had been uniting the tribes, White Fur had been dying. Flint and Blue gathered close. I thought Urken Bears couldn't die, Eska said in a small voice. I thought white fur was beyond the Ice Queen's dark magic. She let her head rest against the bears as the tears began to fall and Flint and Blue did the same. He fought for you out on the Driftlands last year. Flint's voice was choked and he fought inside the palace tonight. He would have fought again, Eska, because his heart was good and true and brave. Urken bears, Eska said through the tears. I remember my past stories about them now. Wanderers call them the ever-wandering ones. They believe that even after they die, their souls speak to us when fresh snow falls. And though the thought of being able to speak to White Fur again sent a glimmer of hope through Eska, it didn't ease the pain, and she cried on for the life of her old friend. They lay with their arms round the Urken Bear for a while longer. Then the sound of pummeling footsteps filled the palace. The prisoners in the ice towers, they've been freed. Flint breathed, forcing himself to his feet. Ma! He rushed from the hall, hand in hand with Blue, and Eska would have followed had her ears not snagged on to another sound. Eska! Eska's legs felt suddenly weak beneath her, and her breath scudded through her throat, because she recognised that voice. Pa! She whispers, and then louder as she rushed towards the arches where the call had come from. Pa! Grabbing an abandoned knife from the ground, Eska leapt out onto the palace wall. She dug the knife into the ice there and used it to clamber up onto the top of the highest stone. Then she stood up tall. Pa! Tomkin and Blade had scaled the ice towers and hacked open the door that blocked the prisoners in. And now men, women, uncles, aunts and grandparents were pouring across the bridges that connected the towers to the palace and rushing into the arms of their children. Eska's eyes flitted between the crowds. Then they fixed on a tall man with broad shoulders who wore the furs of a silver wolf. He was faster than the others over the bridges, but he didn't rush into the palace. He grabbed a spear from the ground, snapped it in two, and then he dug the spikes into the ice dome and began to climb towards his daughter. Eska felt her heart shake. Pa! Wolf Tooth hauled himself up onto the top of the dome, but he didn't stop to gather his breath. He rushed towards Eska and scooped her up in his arms. My little girl, he sobbed. My precious little girl. And as Balapan called out from the velvet sky above, Eska held on to her pa. The epilogue. And so it was that the Ice Queen's rule crumbled. The sun rose just hours after the battle ended, and because this was the midnight sun, the one that would shine all through the spring and summer without ever setting, the enchanted iceberg melted as quickly as it had been conjured. Spires fell, walls slumped, and the ice oozed out into the sea. Nothing remained afterwards. Not even the music box or the silver trees. 
the tribes boarded their sleds and at the invitation of the feather chief and the chieftainess raced across their ice towards the nether cliffs. There was a time for hiding and a time for fighting but this, everyone knew, was the time for a feast. Long into the next day, the tribes talked, ate and drank goblets of cloudberry juice inside the lost chambers. And as so often happens after adventures end, the stories began. Tales of blizzard bulls and wolverines, of willow snatch and cursed musk oxen. But no story was as bold and as magical as the one of Esker, Flint and Blue had to tell. There were interruptions, of course, for stories in their first telling are rarely neat or simple. But despite Blue's dramatic gurgling sounds when recounting the episode with the Thunder Ghost, despite Pebbles yapping at the ice spider incident, and despite Tonkin's apologies to Flint for ever doubting his inventions or the power of Erkenfeld's magic, the trio did, eventually, get to the end of their tale. And all the while the golden eagle perched on Esker's shoulder, the girl wondered whether the bird would leave her now that their quest was over. But then a new story was told by Wolftooth. One from a father to his daughter about a woman who had befriended an orca while caught out at sea. The whale was never tamed, for that would be like trying to tame the waves. But the animal shared a bond with the woman right through to the end, and Esker began to understand, understand then that even though this adventure might be over, something that would not and could not be broken had been left in its wake. Friendship. Between a wanderer and a golden eagle, but also between them and a fox pup, an inventor boy, and a little girl with a very large heart. There was singing and dancing in the hours that followed. The feather tribe sang of ancient giants, much to the grey man's delight, but he made a point of not showing it by complaining extra loudly about the cricked back he had acquired when crawling through the entrance to the lost chambers, because giants like nothing better than a good dose of sympathy. The fur tribe danced a reenactment of a legendary hunt which involved a lot of stamping and quite a few drums and the tusks retold their ancestors' stories through soapstone carvings. As midnight drew near, everyone gathered outside the lost chambers. The sky was still dazzling blue, but despite the sunlight, six stars glinted like faraway diamonds. The sky god's magic was there for all to see and even though the tail of the little bear had lost one of its lights, the constellation seemed to burn brighter than it had done before, and to Esker, Flint and Blue, the stars felt like a reminder of the dear friend they had buried in the Nevercliffs a few hours before, and of what the smallest and most unlikely of tribes could do with a pocket full of courage. Eventually the tribes dispersed, tired from the night of celebration and full of promise for an awakened and harmonious Erkenwald. A plan was formed by Wolftooth and Wildpaw for the following weeks, because when grown-ups get involved, that lamentably happens. But this was a plan built of wanderer rules and fur tribe invitations. The hideaway behind the giant's beard was to be Wolf, to Wolf Tooth and Esker's home for a while until the seasons changed and they felt like moving on. First though, Flint had a detour he wanted to share with Esker, one that involved cloud cushions, weather clocks and moonlight hammocks. But just as Wildpaw and Wolf Tooth were readying their sleds, there was a roar that shook the core of the highest mountain. Two enormous Erkan bears bounded through the snow and stopped before the gathering. Esker dipped her head at the bears and then she climbed up onto one while Flint, Blue and Pebble mounted the other. The children didn't need to tell the bears where they wanted to be taken. The Erkan bears already knew. This was a journey home. They charged through the cliffs and as her golden eagle cried out in the sky above, Esker leant close to the Erkan bear. Her words were hushed and almost lost to the sound of thundering paws, but the wind heard and it carried her voice up and up past the eagle's wings and beyond the peaks of the nether cliffs until it reached the constellations glittering over the kingdom. This is a wild, Esker whispered to the sky gods, and the wild doesn't play by ordinary rules. <laughs>